Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Heartbeat, the place where I talk about just a few of the things that make this little guy tick. Today, I'm going to be talking about episode four of season two of AMC's Better Call Saul. Join me, won't you? So, per usual, I will be talking about a few of the positives from this week's episode, a few of the negatives, as well as what I'm looking forward to in the coming weeks on Better Call Saul. And speaking of the elements that really did work well for me this episode, it's definitely worth noting and praising this episode's writer, Gordon Smith, as well as its director, Adam Bernstein, who are the same team that brought us last season's fantastic Mike-centric episode, 5-0. Though I might have actually liked this one just a little bit more, and one of the main reasons for that was just how it so seamlessly wove together the two different storylines, those being Jimmy's and Mike's. Not even necessarily narratively, though I'm sure that will happen in the weeks to come, but primarily just in its pace, its tone, and its style. Because, quite ironically, before this episode started, I was just commenting to my wife, who hasn't yet watched Breaking Bad, yes, I am a horrible husband, but I promise I will be trying to rectify that quite soon. Um, but I was just commenting to her how different Better Call Saul is from its predecessor. The stakes, the choices the characters made, the adversaries they came in conflict with, all of them on Breaking Bad just were much more life and death. But then we got this episode, which through Vince Gilligan's sorcery was able to take the conflict between Nacho, Mike, and Tuco and intercut that with Jimmy's own struggles trying to keep himself employed, prove himself to his brother, and defend the reputation of his girlfriend, and have both of those plot lines actually carry the same weight and importance in our mind, which is just rather impressive. And speaking of Jimmy's woes, straight off the bat, I was just so pleased with how the writers handled the conflict between he, Cliff Main, and the partners. Not only did it put to rest my concern that his irresponsible actions from last episode would be too easily forgiven, but it also introduced a group of characters beyond Chuck that were in no way falling for Jimmy's showmanship. Especially after last week's kind of dopey presentation of the elderly, it was just nice to have someone come up to Jimmy, stop him, and say, don't act like you don't see what the problem is here. Because it finally felt like he was really coming up against the real world. In kind of an interesting way, it did remind me of some of my favorite moments from The Office, where Michael Scott was constantly getting away with pretty much everything short of murder. And though, yes, it was a silly, over-the-top sitcom, and they could definitely have fun with that, I just loved it, though, any time that David Wallace from Corporate would show up, and in a completely justified, realistic way, lend the show so much more reality by shutting him down. And just like that Cliff's This Is Strike 1 and 2 was just as harsh and realistic as it needed to be. And then it was very rewarding from there, albeit painful, to then cut to Kim and see what she had warned Jimmy about actually coming to pass. She had stuck her neck out for him, and now she was paying the price. And that's one of the reasons why it's so rewarding to watch a Vince Gilligan show, because like real life, in them, nothing is easy, and everything has consequences, which also reminds me of what I still consider to be one of the greatest moments on television ever. That being when Walter White was forced to kill Crazy 8 on Breaking Bad's third episode, who of course had a small cameo this week. And actually, it was because of that expectation that I was just a little bit disappointed, initially anyways, by Kim's decision to continue to cover for Jimmy by not admitting her innocent viewing of the commercial, as well as the subsequent conversation between her and Jimmy in the basement. It was just at that point I was wanting her to, without hesitation, kick him to the curb. I mean, this guy has lied to you repeatedly. Why are you staying with him? But then as the episode continued and I thought about it just a little bit more, I realized it's not time for that relationship to blow up in Jimmy's face. Yet, it wouldn't be devastating enough to him yet, and it wouldn't hurt him enough to push him to become Saul Goodman. Again, yet. And of course, the scene did give Jimmy the request, the rule, the ultimatum that he, being slippin' Jimmy, would find a way to bend. That being, if you go to Howard, we're done. So he doesn't go to Howard. He goes to Chuck, which is actually another interaction I was simply pleased just to see happening because this whole season, Chuck and Jimmy have just been kind of dancing around one another and I was so ready for some real punches to get thrown. But then we got the scene, for Jimmy anyways, of the episode and just the way they teed the thing up with little touches like Jimmy putting his cell phone and watch in the mailbox, which actually is not little at all. That and the subsequent care that he has for his ill brother, yes, the same brother that stabbed him in the back last season, kind of being the first time this season that he'd expressed any sort of sincere, selfless love or 
Am I just being way too optimistic? And were those just some nice slick lawyer tactics to butter Chuck up? Regardless though, I also really appreciated the exchange that the pair had after Chuck woke up. We still felt like these guys were brothers, no matter how much fighting they had done. Like we were watching a pair of enemy soldiers sharing tea from across the river during the American Civil War. And the discussion that follows really being the sister scene to the chimp with the machine gun argument from last season, with kind of two really telling moments for both the characters. One of them being when Chuck declares, Life it's not one big game of let's make a deal. And Jimmy retorts, yes it is. Followed by Chuck almost stooping to Jimmy's level and extorting his brother to get him out of practicing law. But then the show reminding us that Jimmy is still alone and his brother will not be joining him in the dirt. It was interesting that Jimmy was so ready to relinquish his name when he said, no more Jimmy McGill Esquire, poof, like he never existed. And though I don't think this is the exact how and why he takes on the Saul Goodman name and persona, it certainly did get us one step closer to that. Now, Chuck wasn't the only one who was unwilling to do things the easy way when we cut over to Mike, and he decides, after much thought and action, which in and of itself really does differentiate him from Jimmy, that he would not be killing Tuco. And speaking of that terrifying fellow, I continue to really appreciate the way that Breaking Bad cameos are handled on this spin-off show. Each of them more than anything really serving this story, and even when they are setting up certain elements for Breaking Bad, I don't see the writers kind of playing the very easy fan service card with these overindulgent rabbit trails or just winking at the audience. And on this episode, beyond the appearances from Crazy 8 and Mr. Tuco Salamanca, we also get a cameo from Lawson, the arms dealer, who we should really not forget was present for the moment of Mike's big change of heart. When he walked into that scene, he was looking to buy a rifle to kill Tuco. And when he walked out, he wasn't. And more than being present or just a fun Easter egg for Breaking Bad fans, I really felt like his similarities to Mike, his professionalism, his idea that money should be accepted as payment for a job, not a favor, really did allow Mike to feel comfortable enough to open up and talk about what sounded like a past in Vietnam, as well as enable him to decide that killing Tuco wasn't the best move. Even so though, that decision always felt to me like it was more than about being smart. Indeed, all of Mike's actions this season have been firmly grounded in his love for his family and his guilt over letting them down in the past, i.e. getting his son Matt killed. And as I watched Mike continue to push Tuco to beat him further, I couldn't help but think, this is penance. This is this man taking the beating that he believes he deserves. And then the look on Nacho's face at the end of the episode when he saw Mike. For me, that wasn't confusion. Nacho knew why Mike took that beating and was rattled because he knew he should have taken it too. I thought it was also fascinating to see Mike, a man who kind of initially became famous on Breaking Bad for his no half measure speech, actually using a half measure on Tuco, especially as we're aware of a lot of the specific repercussions of that decision. But what I really found exciting was the fact that Mike stole Tuco's very iconic boxing glove necklace, a necklace that we've seen him wearing later down the line in Breaking Bad. So unless Tuco has an extra pair just lying around somewhere or knows a jeweler in New Mexico, my guess is this is not the last time that we will see he and Mike in conflict. But before we start geeking out about potential future collisions, let's just for a second focus on the brilliance of this week's because the writers really were in a tough position having two characters that we knew had to survive because this is not Game of Thrones and there's no resurrection in New Mexico. So how then did they generate stakes in a situation where we the audience knew that both Target and Assassin had to walk away from this conflict? Well, number one, they brilliantly opened the episode by showing us what was, for all we knew, only part of the cost of that conflict. And then two, they followed that reveal up by introducing Tuco as the target and using to their advantage our foreknowledge of his volatile nature and terrifying fists, RIP no doze. And three, they forced Nacho as closely as they could to the center of that conflict because he's the wild card. At the top of the episode, we don't know if Mike was beaten to a bloody pulp only after Nacho himself had been beaten to death. So instead of trying to pull what I call a Doctor Who, which is trying to generate stakes by getting the audience to forget that the Earth won't get blown up or that the Doctor cannot die, Vince Gilligan and his writers said, sure, you know that Tuco and Mike can't die, but you don't know how they got these scars. Nor do you know how much further that damage will bend and break them emotionally, or what sort of collateral damage happened in the process. And man, was it electrifying watching a scene between Mike, Tuco, and Nacho play out. I particularly loved any time they cut to Nacho during that ever-escalating conflict, because he was totally 
me. I could just see in his eyes what exactly is going to happen here because there's this tension that's mounting and I know the only way for it to be released is for something to snap. And indeed, it does. And to close things out, one of the things I've really appreciated about each of these episodes on the second season of Better Call Saul is each time, and it seems to have become a tradition, the writers are kind of challenging themselves to come up with a line that in some way summarizes where the characters are at and what they're struggling with. And for me, I really felt like this episode, it was Tuco's repeated line, Let go! Let go! Let go! Will Maine and Davis let go of Jimmy? Will Kim let go of Jimmy? Will Jimmy let go of his name? Will Chuck let go of his morals? And will Mike let go of his guilt? But of course, we will have to wait until next week and the week after and so on and so forth to find out the answers to all those questions. But good food for thought, I think. Did I miss anything, guys? Comment below. Let me know what you guys thought of the episode. Any fun Easter eggs that I missed out on? Definitely let me know. Also, please do subscribe. I'm going to continue to review films and television on this channel, and I would love for you all to stay up to date on all of those things. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.